Hello everyone, thanks for being here. Um, so the title of this panel is Location, Location, Location. We are going to talk about location, but not only selecting it, also the importance of it. Why community matters, why engaging your community and really becoming a part of it is such an important thing for local economies and for a thriving business. So location is where I want to start. <laughs> um, and what I want to ask is why you each chose the specific neighborhood, the specific place where you started up your business, was it monetary? Was it about something else? And how has that informed how your business has built? And Michael, we can start with you. Yeah. <laughs> Is this working? Yeah, yeah you guys good. Can hear me? So for Ann Pizza, it was kind of a crazy story because I'm from New York and moved down to DC to start up this concept and was looking at real estate for about, I want to say the better part of a year. And we had multiple, is that better? We had multiple landlords turn us down because they couldn't understand the oven technology and how you can cook a pizza so fast and why it doesn't require traditional ventilation. And so it forced us to get really creative. And when I first moved to DC, I started spending a lot of my time on H Street Northeast. Just thought the neighborhood was probably the closest to you know, where I lived and where I hung out in New York. And uh, so I started talking to a lot of the residents there, a lot of the local business owners, and took a liking to the community, and took a liking to the neighborhood. And so decided with the help of uh, a friend who happened to own a concept called Taylor Gourmet uh, to sign a lease and open up right next door. And the irony was is that our real estate brokers thought we were crazy. They're like, H Street Northeast, that doesn't make sense. There's not a single <laughs> national or even regional chain there. You guys are committing real estate suicide. <laughs> um, and we said, you know what, it feels right. And <laughs> the neighborhood, uh, the people feel right. They seem like they're gonna be supportive and we're gonna go for it. Because with real estate, I think with your first, you just never really know if it's gonna work, if it's not gonna work. And so we opened up and uh, one of the things that we did prior to opening it was spend a lot of time like I said, meeting folks, who are the influencers, you know, what are the charitable needs um, or causes that we can kind of support and help people out before opening up our doors and saying, hey, come support us, come right. buy our pizza, come uh, be a part of this brand. And it worked. And so we opened up and there were lines out the door. And that was the catalyst to uh, the success of the brand. And without H Street, without that neighborhood, and pizza would not have 13 locations today. Yeah. Brandon? Yeah, I mean, um, you know, for us, there was a little bit more, a little bit less choice in where we were going to open up uh, because the alcohol manufacturing industry is a commercial manufacturing industry. We had to be in a commercial manufacturing zoned area. And uh, there's a lot uh, more limitations on, on where we could actually set up shop. Um, most of the space downtown closer um, to where all the action was is not zoned in that manner. So we had to sort of look on some of the outlying areas around town. Uh, most of the CM zoning is sort of on the borders. But actually that was very helpful to us because uh, we did not have a lot of money when we started up. Um, we were sort of doing it on a bare bones, scrap together budget, and it just so happened that these areas were also more affordable. So I think affordability factored into it for sure, um, but it was just sort of uh, the way things worked out because we, we had to be in sort of these more industrial areas. Yeah. Uh, the area that we're at, we actually love, and we've been embraced by the community there. At first, I think you know there was a little apprehension because people didn't really know or understand what we would be doing. Are we going to be a bar? Are we going to be a restaurant? Um, but you know, the community was really open to understanding, listening to us, and understanding that we were a manufacturing facility and not really you know just taking people in, giving them a bunch of beer, and kicking them back out <laughs> on the street. Um, so we you know developed a really good bond with our neighbors, and we've actually been involved with a lot of community organizations in that as well. I think no matter where you set up shop for any business, especially as a small business, it's really important that you do connect with your community because that is going to be uh, your, your main uh, base, customer base, but also, you know, especially if you're, if you're a locationally branded or a locationally oriented business, it's really important that you are interacting um, and giving back to that community as well. Otherwise, right. it's just sort of a marketing tool and I don't think anybody really likes to support a business that is on the outlying side of what they're professing they're trying to do. Yep. 
And Pixie, can you talk a little bit about your situation? Because I know your current location wasn't your original location. So talk to me a little bit about both, both of those. <laughs> um, the, my first location was in Adams Morgan. It was a very small space. It was 500 square feet. Um, and I saw vintage and, um, you know, furniture that I buy at auctions. So, oops, I'm sure I got this right. And we really flourished at that space. We were there from 97 to 2008. Um, and then along came real estate prices and my landlord sold the building. And I got a really great deal on a big 4,000 square foot space in Adams Moore in, um, on 14th Street. Mm -hmm. And um, my rent was super cheap. <laughs> and uh, it stayed that way for a while. I had 2,000 square feet that we didn't even use um, just because the growth was too fast for me. And as I kind of figured it out, um, we started to use more and more space. And then my rent tripled um, when I signed a new lease. So we use all the space. Um, and we do a lot of events. We've had, we've had plays there. We do holiday markets there. Um, we do our art show for local, local artists there. Um, a lot of people come into our store almost every day on the way back, back and forth from work. We bake little cookies, so there's always cookies there. That keeps them coming in. Um, and uh, it, the communities in both neighborhoods have been really supportive. I'd like to go back to Adams Morgan, but there is, there's not a space there. Actually, the real estate's more expensive there, surprisingly enough, than 14th Street. So all of you touched on this a little bit, and now I want to dig a little deeper into how you create an authentic relationship with your community, how it's not something like come in once and get this free thing and love us forever, <laughs> and <laughs> then you expect you know, some sort of loyalty or relationship. How do you actually go out into the community as a business owner, engage with them in a real way, create a customer base, but also just create support and create relationships there? Well, um, yeah, I'll, I'll jump in on this one. I yeah. mean, I think that a lot of it has to do as a business owner with being there and showing up. And people, you know, respond to meeting you because nobody can tell the story of your business like you can. Yeah. And that's your first chance to really make that connection with your community, um, not just as a customer, but as a member of that community. Because if you're moving your business into somewhere, it's even more so than buying a house somewhere. You know, you are now part of this community. Um, and, and, and people want to know that you're going to be responsible and you're going to, you're going to, you know, step up to the plate. Um, but really when it comes to giving back, you know, there's, there's lots of ways to do it. Um, we do community involvement as far as like, you know, we get together on the trash days when the community is out picking up trash, we participate in those. Uh, we also participate with a lot of local charity, uh, and charitable giving, uh, you know, we, we do, uh, fundraisers at the brewery all the time. Um, we also have things like our holiday market that we just had, and you know, Pixie was just talking about that. That's great because involving your community, uh, yes, there's the micro community, like right around where your business is located, but we're all part of this bigger community. And you know, like the market we just had, we've got, you know, we had everybody from you know, John Y who makes belts to you know, Nathan Onda from Red Apron there. So um, we've got a lot of other folks who are involved in the community as well and we're all sort of interacting together as one which brings people in but moreover i think especially when you got a product people like to know that what they're supporting is authentic right. and that they're seeing where their dollar is going and there's no way to do that like coming out to visit you seeing your place and seeing us as owners there yeah yeah and i, I agree i think being there as an owner is really important and giving your employees the right to represent you and know everything there is about you. I mean, our business model is really simple. We buy everything at auction. We bring it in on Tuesday and Wednesday. We price it. It's on the website. It's out. Um, and, um, you know, we, with the holiday markets, we did the same thing. We have a lot of local craftspeople. Um, we do fundraisers. Um, we, and, and, you know, it's great. A lot of people in the neighborhood, you know, come in and thank us for being there, thank us for being an anchor. Um, thank us for being able to call a few people and say, you know, we need more police protection. We need more people on the streets. We're, I'm working with a business improvement district that's trying to start on 14th Street. Um, so, I, you know, and they ask us to donate to stuff. We're happy to always do that. Um, I think just always being there for your community right. is really, really important. And Michael, my question is twofold for you on this one because you guys have several locations. So 
one, how do you engage with communities where you are so spread out? And also, how do you keep brand authenticity through all of those different locations? <laughs> I would, to, to answer the first part, I would say that you, know, you have to hire smarter. Right. And you have to teach people um, the why behind the brand. Right? We have this philosophy, sort of start with the why. If any of you have followed Simon Sinek, um, he's been preaching this for the past couple of years. And so if you hire people that subscribe to your core values and that they understand the vision right, and the philosophy behind the brand itself, then they can you know, preach the and pizza or whatever brand's gospel um, as well as a founder can. In terms of you know, maintaining the integrity of the brand, I mean, that's, that's something that I think every, we call ourselves a collective of bespoke pizza shops, right? not a chain, but I right. think that's what every traditional <laughs> chain struggles with. As you get bigger, there's inherent dilution yeah. um, because you're further and further away. Before, I could ride my motorcycle to two or three pizza shops in a matter of a couple hours. Now there's 13, and as far as Germantown, you know, all the way to um, the Dulles Airport, that's a hike. And so you're not going to get there <laughs> dedicating to airport security. Uh, that's, that's not easy. And so that really comes down to making each one for us unique mm -hmm. and different. Uh, and the menu is relatively similar, but the people represent the community. The design, the aesthetic um, also represents the neighborhood. And when you do little things like that, I don't think there's this expectation that everyone is going to be the same. It's going to more take the shape and take the form of what's around it. All right. And the thing I want to move on to now is an issue that we're dealing with in D.C. and cities all over the country in a million different ways. But I want to focus in on how you guys as small business owners deal with change within communities, deal with gentrification, deal with rising rents, deal with all of these issues. Um, you know, as I walk around, I lived in Bloomingdale for a while. There was a sign up in one store that said closed due to gentrification. Um, they couldn't afford their rent anymore, so they moved out. And you know, it was yeah. It, yeah, it wasn't necessarily a peaceful yeah. parting. It right. was it was really sad. Um, so how do you guys deal with that? Because it's also a bit of a chicken and an egg thing. Because as the local economy picks up, as more small businesses come in, the neighborhood gets better. People want to move in. They want to have these restaurants. They want to have these nice things. So how do you deal with being someplace, engaging with the community, and then change showing up? Anyone want to take that one? <laughs> uh, for me, it, it, it hit me all at once. I literally, you know, when my rent tripled, I had to um, use every single bit of space that I had. I had to become immediately efficient. It didn't happen that way, but yeah. we, that was our goal. Um, you know, I did have to cut back on staff or make sure that everyone was busy, busy, busy all the time. Um, you know, we just had to, and we had to plan for the future. And luckily my landlord loved me and built in a really great 3% uh, increase for my next lease which um, after the last one was a huge relief. So I can plan to stay there as opposed to like, okay, we're gonna be wrapping this up in a year and a half. Yeah. Um, but we just have to stay on top of the numbers all the time, which I've never been really good at. I've always had somebody there for, for that, but that's something every week that has to be reviewed every day. Um, so you just have to not throw money away. Yeah, uh, yeah I mean, I, I think that that's definitely uh, relevant, especially you know, with your experience, you know, being along that corridor and, and seeing how it's changed so much in the past <laughs> couple of years. We're still where we're at. We're still a little bit far off from that, but you can see the, the landscape of the city changing. And I think that's happening across the entire country. Um, but you know, these these movements are happening. People are um, are staying in the city, developing neighborhoods, and and you know. I feel like I feel like overall there there's a lot of support for for these independent businesses because if you look at the businesses that are opening up, there is a lot of independent spirit there. You know, it's not um, you know the big corporate restaurant chains of the world that are coming in and and developing the neighborhoods. There's it's independent small businesses, and that's what's sort of transforming these neighborhoods. So, you know, it's the sort of thing there is no real easy answer to. Um, there's, there's positives and there's negatives, and yeah. I think that it's sort of apparent. Yeah. Want me to answer that too? Um, if you had an answer for <laughs> yeah, it, I mean, sure. So we deal, I mean, there's two sides to it. So there's the side of 
you know, we don't want to be that guy coming in and not appealing to the folks that have lived there for 20 or 30 years, yeah. only appealing to the new crowd that's just moved in two or three years ago. So our, we look at it from a guest perspective and then from a business perspective. And the thesis behind our guest perspective is we want to price everyone in. And if anyone's been to an Ann Pizza before, you'll know the pricing model is sort of one size fits all. And when we opened up on H Street, I think one of my fondest memories is a number of um, folks from the community coming up to me and just saying thank you. Thank you for uh, bringing food and a price point that works in this neighborhood. Yeah. And we feel like you're truly thinking about us and not just thinking about yourself. And we've applied that philosophy and we'll continue to apply it. And from a business perspective, you know, if you've also been into an Ann Pizza, you'll realize they're kind of small, um, sometimes to a detriment of making money, but that allows us as a business to weather storms. Yep. And so we're not necessarily beholden to everything has to be perfect. Um, in a smaller box, you can afford to uh, not have necessarily the volume or if volume disappears or spikes, you know, you can manage to. it. Yeah. So sticking with the topic of growth, um, you know, when we were backstage, I asked if you guys, you know, we're all friends, you guys all hang out. <laughs> seems like you guys knew each other pretty well. With all of this growth, it seems like there is a new bar, a new restaurant, a new something opening every 30 seconds within DC. How are you guys dealing with increased competition? Is it a good thing for businesses that have been here for so long? Is it, you know, bringing more attention? Is it bringing more people? Are people more willing to spend? Or, you know, is it something that you guys are kind of like back out of my space a little bit? <laughs> Um, well, well, for me, the business I'm in, unfortunately, a few of people in my business have closed. Um, yeah. I think for restaurants and bars, it's, a, it's exploding. Um, I think for what I do, it's not. So um, I, that's why I'm happy to support people. I've had people come in, they're like, I want to do what you do. And I tell them about what it takes, and they're like, okay, I'll just keep my job. <laughs> and, but, but if there's a place I can tell them to go to that rents are good or um, any guidance that I can give them, I, I try to do that because it's, it's, it's difficult. Um, you know, there's only so much money I can make in the furniture, in, you know, the used furniture business. Um, you, you know... I've tried to expand. I can't handle it. Yeah. <laughs> you know, when I hear about you have 13 spaces, that's fantastic. And I know um, DC Brow's just grown by leaps and bounds, and I'm, and I'm happy for that. That's good. I'd like to stay right where I am. Kind of. <laughs> yeah, I think this is a really cool question for the three sort of different businesses yeah. that are here, because we're all a little bit different. So, you know, we've got, there's several more breweries that have opened since we've opened up, but there has also been this explosive growth in the restaurant and bar industry. Um, which obviously is a main distribution route for our product. So we've seen um, a growing market need, and we've seen uh, other people responding to that need as well as us. And it's actually been it's been great. It's been a friendly competition that you know we we keep up with one another, and and we are on friendly terms with the other breweries. But also, it motivates every one of us to sort of stay on top of our game to continue to make products that we find new and exciting and to continue to try and improve the products that we're already doing. And there's also a bit of a, a good for the goose, good for the gander mentality when it comes to our on-premise uh, as well, because you know we, we were a little nervous when the other breweries started doing their growler hours. Um, and what we found was that it, it really ex, you know, accentuated everything that was going on. Instead of people coming to our facility and then going to do something else, they were now going on tours of multiple breweries and we were getting bike clubs coming by on tours. We were getting bus groups coming in from the suburbs going to all the different city breweries and it really was a great sort of community uh, builder I think for us. Okay. And did you have any thoughts on, I mean you guys are part of that huge growth right? You guys have been expanding really well. Yeah I think I've never looked at, We I think as, as, as small business owners the biggest competition is competing with ourselves mm -hmm. and making sure that you know we can execute on our ideas on our thoughts on our purpose and intention and if you do that well uh, competition likely won't you know be an issue All right. so now we want to take some questions from the audience I'm sure you are sick of me asking questions <laughs> so if you have anything you'd like to ask our panelists no one has any questions? Oh. <laughs> We have two back there. I think we have a mic right there. 
Just, just your impressions, Pixie. You have moved several times, have you, even within the same corridor, if I recall correctly. And so, in, in every location, even within the same corridor, you know, what was that experience? Because it seemed to me that you had to kind of re, I don't know, if it seems you have to kind of remarket yourself even within the same neighborhood. Right. And, um, then, and then it was a big change going to 14th. Uh, for, going to so. 14th was a huge change, and it was not pretty when we got there. I mean, we still had the riot bars on the windows, which, you know, everyone advised us against taking off the, the front windows, and I was like, you know. Um, but when we were on, um, in Adams Morgan, we were in two different locations, literally a stone's throw away from, like, across the street and down the block. And I had customers that wouldn't come down onto 18th Street um, because, you know, they don't go on 18th Street as opposed to a block away, which is my old store. Um, so, you know, it's, it's odd. We had a store in uh, DuPont Circle for a while, and they were, they were really demanding, very different than Adams Morgan. And um, we actually, I couldn't, I couldn't handle it. I actually, we closed that store. Having two stores open at one time was um, just something that didn't work for us. I do have a second store in Rehoboth now, but that's open seasonally, and it's three hours away, so it doesn't make a difference. But 14th um, Street, um, you know, I can sell higher-end things on 14th Street. Um, sometimes I'll price something and people will say, what's wrong with it? Why is it only like $300? And I'm like, oh, okay. <laughs> um, so, and my rent has increased, so that my price point has increased, but I still, you know, you can go in there sometimes and still get a, you know, a kitchen table for 80 bucks, you know, or one for 1100 bucks. So I, I have to, I'd like to think if I still have my following, uh, I'd like to have what the people that started following me for, I'd like to have that for them as, as well as what the new people come in want. So I, I do have to, luckily I have 4,000 square feet to do that now, so. Yeah, I have to keep it changed up. Other questions? I think there's one back there and then right here. Am I up? Hi. Uh, this question is for Michael. Michael, I live uh, like two blocks from your H Street restaurant, and we waited thir 13 years for a place like yours. So right on. Thank, <laughs> Thank you very you. much. I, I'm just curious, um, in terms of your expansion, yeah. how easy or hard has it been to find the workforce that you need in D.C.? <laughs> So that, that's a, a million dollar, well, it's a million dollar answer if I can answer it right, but it, it's, it's hard. And I think it's hard because if you go too fast, and we experienced a little bit of that um, from the second half of last year to the first half of this year, which is opening up shops prior to having the people ready to lead and to work within those shops and recognize that you know there was, um, some of our restaurants just not operating correctly. Or restaurants like H Street, for example, it kind of got away from us for a good 12 to 18 months, and we've worked really hard to kind of try to turn that around, including spending $450,000 in a remodel, which we just did, uh, to just say, hey, we care about this. It's our first and our most important shop and always will be. But we are, are focused on over-investing. I don't even call it an over-investment because you can never invest too little in your people. We call them our tribe, but we are constantly uh, recruiting, doing active recruiting, um, any way that we can to find the profile of the people that really work well inside of our shop. So it's profiling, and then it's going hard into areas that you feel like these people are going to just do a fantastic job. Because as an employer, you got to find a win-win. It's not just about hiring people that can do the job. It's hiring people that are the fit, that subscribe to your values. And then in turn, they can look at you and say, you're also a fit. So when I interview, I'm also being interviewed, and I tell that to all of our uh, tribe, which is, you know, this has got to be a win-win. So it's, it's hard to do, but it's something that we're committed to doing and are going to keep investing until we get it right. And I think we had another question right up here, and there's a mic. Hi. Uh, those are some great corridors you all are on. And um, I'm coming from east of the river. Uh, you yeah. hear this term, you know, and my question is, we have a lot of small businesses trying to replicate what's happening across the city, but we see them opening and they're closing. Is there anything that you would suggest to a small business owner 
that would help them facilitate a successful venture over there east of the river? I, I mean, I, I, I don't want to sugarcoat this. Like, having the proper amount of money to start really is super important. And for us, we had barely enough. I mean, we, we barely scraped by. Um, and, you know, if we could do it again, I would have wanted to have a, a, another third on top of what we had um, in order to do it successfully. And, you know, I don't know, that, I don't know that that's the case, but I think that that's always the biggest obstacle to really opening. Um, and a lot of times people sugarcoat it and, you know, sort of make it lovey-dovey and this and that, but the cold hard facts is it's a business and, and you, need, you need to have the right amount of cash. And I think as an entrepreneur, you got to really be honest with yourself from the very start as to what's going to happen. I mean, I know that we found ourselves saying, oh, well, we can, we can still get by if we do this or we can still get by if we do that. And the right answer really has to be always always to have the proper planning and proper money. I don't know the specifics of what's going on over there, but I would really advise anybody who's, who's going into business to be honest with themselves, uh, be real with the estimates of what it's going to take, and then some. Because, um, you know, uh, a third more and three times as long is really pretty true. Um, you know, so I, I just say honesty in that regard with yourself is, is really important. Um, but besides that, I can't speak to anything specific. Were there any others? I see one right there. Thank you. Pixie, how can we get you back to Adams Morgan? Uh, as, big space with cheap rent. <laughs> um, as a person who's lived in Adams Morgan for many years, I'm starting to feel left out and, and slightly covetous of U Street and 14th um, and wondering what can, um, Adams Morgan is getting a bunch of new construction, which is going to have storefront requirements. Uh, as a citizen there who goes to the meetings now and is a cranky homeowner even, um, what do you suggest that we do to lure in um, these kind of attractive artisan local businesses? Because it seems to me, and what's your impression of Adams Morgan? Because it's sort of on the cusp of something right now, but nobody's sure what, unless we can get Pixie back. <laughs> um, for me, I, I live in Adams Morgan. I would love to be part of my community again. But um, even with the new buildings, uh, it's it's very very expensive. And I I um, I think that negotiations can be made. I think that um, you know I, you know I'm not really sure. Other than um, I think Adams Morgan is about to be where it needs to be again. Uh, there's a hotel going in, there's lots of new building. Uh, for me to have a furniture store there again with you know all those new condos and things would be really good. But I haven't been able to, um, I've talked to, every time something new comes up or is available, the numbers they give me just kind of shock me. Um, I think if someone's in the bar or restaurant business, that's, that's what's gonna work for them. But I think that's where Adams Morgan got lopsided in the first place. You know, it used to be a lot of retail and then it was all restaurants and bars. So it's hard to keep a balance. Um, and when, you know, you have taxes and you have rent and you have uh, all that to consider, it, it, it's, it's hard to do. All right, guys, Good thank you. <laughs> I think can that I, has- Can I answer that too? Do we have time? Yeah. Okay. Just because, so I've been looking at Adams Morgan for two years, the better part of two years. We have, we've kind of narrowed it down to two spaces. The challenge with Adams Morgan for a lot of restaurant concepts, maybe like the Sweet Greens or the Cavas or the Taylors is that there's not much lunch business and they make most of their money at lunch. We, because we're pizza and we also do well when people have had a few drinks, um, can do well in Adams Morgan. The, the other issue is there's a lot of single family landlords. And so the buildings are in really bad shape and they're not willing to spend any money to attract tenants. So you're gonna get a building in the condition is referred to as is, which as is means if the roof caves in, I have to pay for it, right? If there's an electrical problem, I have to pay for it. That doesn't work for a lot of businesses like ours, where at a minimum they need the right electrical, they need the right mechanical, they need the right plumbing. Um, and structurally, the building has to be sound. And a lot of buildings at Adams Morgan just aren't structurally sound. Yeah. And that is 
the death of a restaurant because if you take an as-is condition, you can be hundreds of thousands of dollars in over your head. And that's, and that's tough. And the landlords are firm. And so they'll go after a worse concept because someone can pay the bill today versus reinvesting um, in that building and in that community for the long term. And so I'm constantly fighting with landlords trying to pitch them on why their thinking is short-sighted. But the High Line, which is the new hotel, it's going to be fantastic. Seidel Group, they're behind the Ace Hotel. I think that in and of itself will bring a lot of interesting businesses into Adams Ward, which is a fantastic neighborhood. Thank you guys so much for your questions and your time, and thank you to our panel. You guys were wonderful. Thanks.